All right, good morning, good morning, good morning. You know, I believe in, in starting on time. So the, the time is ready for us to begin a wonderful Sunday school lesson. I'm excited about it. I have been looking forward uh, to getting here uh, for Sunday school hour. I was going to wait until uh, August to start it, but then I realized there's no need to wait. We no need to waste a Sunday. And so if the Lord gives me strength in the body, then it's time for us to serve him uh, in full capacity. So I thank God for all of you who are here with us this morning and even those who might be watching online. I would that we bow for a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day. We honor you, O oh God, and we praise you for just another moment to share in worship and in your word. God, it's by life that we have this ability and we thank you for our life and we thank you, O oh God, that not only because of our physical life, but the word, your word, gives us life. And I praise you right now for what you're going to do in this moment of teaching. And I ask that you clear every heart and clear every mind that we will hear your word this morning, O oh God, and that we will grow from this word and accept the challenge that comes through this word to touch not only us, but to transform us, that we might in a, be enabled to transform the world that we live. Have your way right now, O oh God, in the precious name of Jesus, and we ask for healing for those who might be sick, those who have appointments this week, O oh God, to check conditions. I speak life into them right now, O oh God, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, according to your will, I speak healing and deliverance right now. So do as you will, God, and we'll give you glory, honor, and praise in the name of Jesus. We say amen. 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 Good to see you. Come on in. This morning, I'm going to be running through, thank you, uh, running through Genesis chapter 14. So come with me there. And we're going to be in Genesis 14, um, 18 through 20 for the next few weeks. And we're going to use as a subject, grace all the time. This is the case for biblical principle of tithing. Grace all the time, the case for the biblical principle of tithing. Now, I can start teaching tithing today, but the problem with that is I will not give any integrity to the context of Genesis 14, 18 through 20. So I would rather introduce the scripture text by giving the context to show you exactly what's going on rather than just jump into tithing because I believe in the integrity of the pulpit and I believe in truth over money. If I was just about making money to get you to tithe, then I would not even worry about um, giving the context, but there's so much to the context that gives rise to the uh, word of God on tithing. And I want you to know that Genesis 14, 18 through 20, this is the first time you will see in the scripture about tithing. So that's why we're here. It is the first time that we will be introduced to tithing. So it just makes good sense to know the context that the writer uses to give us the understanding of tithing. And so today, we're going to deal with the context of it all. So this is a series. This is part one. You can just call it the introduction. Grace all the time. The case for the biblical principle of tithing. Now, when we read the context, we will come to an understanding that by the end of the class, we will be able to demonstrate the keys to revolution because this scripture text is about a revolution. <clears throat> right here in this scripture, Genesis 14, 18 through 20, listen to what it says. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. 
And he was the priest of the most high God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he gave him tithes of all. The context of this scripture is there is a wicked king, Ketolomer of Elam. Ketolomer, he had a rebellion against him by five cities. They're called the five cities of the plain, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Zoar. These five cities had been paying tribute to this wicked king. To keep him from destroying them, to have his protection, they were paying tribute to him, even though he was a wicked, oppressive king. And after 12 years, in the 13th year, they rebelled against him. And the scripture teaches, if you read the earlier verses, that in the 14th year, the king now, this wicked king, he responded to the rebellion with a mighty campaign to show Elam's might to all the territories under the Elamite empire. But he made a mistake. He crushed the cities. He killed. He demolished. He stole. Took women and children back um, with him in captivity. He stole all of the possessions. He destroyed all that he could, but he made a mistake because earlier on you will see where his mistake was, he took with him Lot, Abram's nephew. And when he took Lot, Lot's entire household, and all of Lot's possessions, that proved to be his mistake because now Abram, God's chosen, Abram, the one anointed by God, Abram, Lot's uncle, when he got the news, the scripture says in previous verses that he assembled a battle team, a unit of 318 men that went to war and they defeated this wicked king and they took back everything that he stole. They took back Every one that he had taken, Abram got the victory. And it's when he came home that he gave a tithe to Melchizedek. Again, this is the first time that you see in scripture about the use of tithing. And we have to deal with it uh, in context because the context of it is tithing is rooted in rebellion. So we have Abram. God's servant, God's chosen man to build a nation on. We are the seed of Abraham. God used him, and it's right here that he gains a mighty victory. Now, I want you to look carefully at the previous verses because I'm going to go through some of this with you because there is much to learn today about rebellion. In verse 13, the scripture says that Abram, the Hebrew, Notice that title, Abram the Hebrew. You see that there? That is the first use of the term Hebrew in the Bible. Right there, verse 13, it says Abram the Hebrew. Now, the reason that's important is because according to the root of the word, Hebrew means passed over, passed over. Some scholars believe that it means it means that they, the Hebrew is the one who came from a geographical location who passed over. But historically in the Bible, we understand passed over. It means just what it says. People who are neglected, people who are disrespected, people who are disregarded, people unworthy of respect. They are treated in a very negative, demeaning way. So when you see Abram, the Hebrew, the scripture is pointing out something very, very amazing. Go back to chapter 13 and go back to chapter 12 and 
read the story of Abram, and you'll see that Abram is wealthy. He is a powerful, notable man in his community. He has immense wealth. Chapter 13, he had so much wealth that he and Lot, his nephew, had to go their separate ways because their, their, their cattle had grown and had, he had such increase that the land couldn't support him. And so Lot went one way and pitched his tent facing Sodom and Abram went another way because he was that wealthy. So isn't it amazing that Abram, this wealthy man, Abram, this anointed and appointed man of God, that Abram is still called the Hebrew. He's wealthy, but yet he's thought of as to be disregarded. He's wealthy, but he is still one of the passed over people. This lesson speaks mightily to the African American today because we have learned a very hard lesson in America. And that is this, it doesn't matter your level of education, it doesn't matter where you live, it doesn't matter about your level of income, the bottom line is you are still to be disregarded. You are still to be a person neglected, a person unworthy of respect. Isn't it amazing? I remember watching my father at times, no matter how much he achieved, that he could be looked at in, uh, in a way where people disregarded him. People did not uh, give him the respect that was due him. And I would ask him, doesn't that bother you? And he said, I'm not going to let it bother me because I already know who I am in God. And I know what God is doing through me. And then he threw a little jab in at this. He says, they might uh, not like the color of my skin, but my bank account is bigger than theirs. <laughs> But Abram the Hebrew, he's wealthy, but he's disregarded. He's passed over. And so one thing that we can learn from this today is being black in America and being disregarded, having your degrees, having your experience and your income or wealth in corporate America, uh, only to be still looked down upon. You're not alone. It's not the first time it's happened. This is part of nature. Even though it's, it's a part of nature, it doesn't mean it's right. But if Abram was still called the Hebrew, then you better expect that people are going to pass you over and give you a lack of respect as well. What we learn from this scripture text is Abram was a part of a group that paid tribute to the wicked king. He lived under this rule and he was part of the rebellion. Rebellion means to not simply to fight back, but a rebellion seeks to overturn a system. A rebellion seeks to undo a systemic problem, to undo a normative trait or value in society that is demeaning and destructive to a body of people. America needs a rebellion. Now, I want you to think about this lesson today in light of our groups. We have the NAACP, we have the SCLC, we have Black Lives Matter, we have other grassroots organizations. All of them are fighting for quote unquote equality and justice. We have the LGBTQ fighting for equal rights, equality and justice. You now have a canceled culture that's willing to stand up and fight against uh, what seemed to be sexual harassment in the workplace and, and all over because people are looking for rebellion. But I want you to understand something. A movement is not necessarily a rebellion. A movement is not necessarily a rebellion. We look for so much change out of President Barack Obama and when we didn't get it, we rationalize it's his first term. We'll wait till the second term. He can't do much in the first term. And when the second term came, you got much of what you saw in the first. One, because the presidency is a ceremonial position, but then two, it really wasn't his place to make change. 
because change comes from the people. It doesn't come from an office. When the people have had enough, when the people truly seek rebellion, then the system will change. We've had protests. We've had riots. We've had sit-ins. We've had prayer vigils. We've had people blocking the roads. We've had uh, pundits on the news. We've had sound bites on social media. People have been speaking out against injustice and inequality all across the board, but there is still no change. Money has been flowing. The government has been giving out money. Millions and millions and millions have gone to Black Lives Matter. And millions have gone to grassroots groups right here in Minnesota to stop the crime. But the crime is still prevalent. The injustice is still there. The system is still intact. Why? Because movements are not equated with rebellion. And we need a rebellion. Let's look at on the screen. I want you to notice what's on the screen because on the screen we see a truth. The wealthiest 1% of Americans control about $41.52 trillion. Thank you. The top 1%. The wealthiest 1% control $41.52 trillion. Now, let's make that make sense. Over to the right, you'll see where it says that the average annual income of the top 1%, this is the average annual income, $1,316,985, the top 1%. That's their annual income, while the average income of the bottom 99% is only 50,107. You see the disparity? Wealth in America, it is so disparate, it is so uh, far apart from the top 1% who own over $41 trillion of the wealth. They control over $41 trillion of the wealth while the bottom 99% fight over $50,000 a year. The system will not change until there's a rebellion. And right here in our scripture text where tithing is born, it's born out of a rebellion a successful rebellion. But what made the rebellion happen was the fact that they stole the wrong kid. They, had they not taken Lot, wouldn't have been a problem. This story, we, we would not be having this discussion this morning. But they took Lot, and when they took Lot, Abram got active and he put together 318 men from his house and he went to war and he, he capped off the rebellion, he got victory. Now, this is important because God seeks a revolution. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20, verse 16. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20, verse 16. Matthew 20, verse 16. Look what it says. The last or the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. That, that's revolution. Through Christ, he's talking about a revolution. You want to know what got Jesus killed? What got him killed was not having a fish fry on the side of a mountain for 15,000 people. What got him killed was not raising people from the dead. What got him killed was this right here. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. That, that's revolution talk. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's revolution talk. And we've never understood that because we've never connected the dots, the dots of the gospel. Understand this, that the true gospel of Jesus Christ, when the gospel of Christ changes your mind, 
If any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creature. What? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. That's a, a change of mind, change of world view, change of ideas, change of conclusions, new results. When Christ comes in, he changes you. Let this mind be in you. When he comes in, he comes in with the change. And the change that comes to a believer, it alters society. So when, 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 when Christ is real, in the individual, it'll change the economy, it'll change politics, it'll change government. See, a true revolution happens through Christ. This is what we believe, but it's sad that we have never uh, been able to demonstrate it because right in the church, we have been wrong. Right in the church, we have been misled. Right from the pulpit, because the pulpit has been teaching the church that if we do a food program, we're going to change our community. That if we supply jobs, we're going to change our community. That if we uh, take grant money and we um, empower our youth with computer education, we're going to change our community. No, what happens is some lives are better because of the food. Some lives are better because of the handouts. Some lives are better because of the jobs or the computers or after school programming and daycare. Some lives are better, but it's not a revolution. Because the real revolution happens when Christ is real. Isn't it crazy? The church has been out marching and protesting, and, and that's, that's a staple of the black church from the civil rights era forward. Our voices need to be heard. We should protest, but we should understand this, that the real revolution happens when Christ becomes real, not because we're in the street marching. If we never marched, please hear this, if we never march, but we start demonstrating the full authority of Jesus Christ within us, it'll change everything. Because guess what? When Christ is real, he changes your money habits, first of all. Because when Christ is real, he'll change the way you spend money. When Christ is real, what, what does he teach? Love your neighbor as you love yourself, right? Now, now the world system is not built on love. The world system is not built on spending according to the principles of God. The world system is not built on the principles of God. Write these scriptures down. I'm not going to go through them. I don't have time today. Write these scriptures down. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. The Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 31. The Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 31. And then, finally, Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 2. Ephesians 2, 2. All of these scriptures talk about the fact that Satan rules this world. That's what they all talk about that he is the prince of the air, that he is the ruler of this world. All of these scriptures present the fact that the world that we live in, it's under satanic authority. And so that's why the systems won't change. You can educate police all you want on, on cultural diversity, but there'll still be problems. You can get in the school system and you can teach critical theory, but nothing will change. The race theory, nothing will change. You can, you can look to the government, your mayor, the police chief, the, the, uh, the Senate, the House. You can look at, at the White House. Nothing will ever change, whether it's a male in the White House, a female in the White House, white or black. It doesn't matter, gay or straight. We're still going to have problems. Why? Because this world is under satanic authority. But the presence of Christ breaks through Satan's rule, 
and the gospel of Jesus Christ, when it's real, changes your mind. The gospel of Christ doesn't just give you a shout in church. It changes your fundamental way of being, the presentation of you. Because when Christ is real, he interrupts the economy. He interrupts politics. He interrupts business as normal. And you want to know why they killed him? This is why. Because his gospel created a rebellion. It was overturning the system from the bottom up. He didn't have to run for dog catcher. He didn't have to run for any political office. All he had to do was walk in the authority that God gave him. And if the body of Christ walks in the authority that we have in Jesus Christ, living a transformed life, that's all you got to do. Live a transformed life in your house with your family and demand that your family live it. And then from there, they reach others. And all around, if we live a transformed life, we can interrupt the world and make a change. Now, if everyone doesn't do that, that's okay. Because if the church does it, if all of kingdom life live the transformed life and have a body of rules that we live by, not just in the church, but even at home, that when we are at home, you can come to my house. My house might look different than yours. But how the house is run going to be the same as yours. If we all operated by the same principles through the gospel of Christ, that, that this is the way our houses are going to be run. This is the way our money is going to be spent. This is the way that we're going to treat people. This is the way that you can depend on the demonstration of Jesus Christ. It's in every single house. Doesn't matter who the people are, it's going to be the same. If we did that, we could make a major change. But we won't make a dent in Satan's kingdom until we operate and seek revolution. That's what we're after, a revolution, a change in the system. And we have to have it because Satan rules this world. Now, I want to go, finally, because I want to leave some room. I want to put this out here to you. God gave me this, and I want you to look at this on the screen because this is a true statement. Revolution in America will only happen when everyone in the bottom 99% of wealth feels the everyday threat of black America. When God gave me that, I knew that I was on the right track. Revolution in America will only happen when everyone in the bottom 99% of wealth feels the everyday threat of black America. That's when a revolution will happen. Why haven't we had change? Just in the black community, we all don't agree with Black Lives Matter. We all don't come out when there's a shooting. And I'm not even talking about when the police kill. I'm talking about when we kill. Come on. Isn't it amazing? The only news that makes itself worthy is when there's a white and black killing. But nobody talks about 94% of the black homicides in the black community are committed by black folk. We don't come out when we kill. We don't come out when we do things that are wrong. Why don't we come out? Because we're not united. Because every black person doesn't feel the same threat. White America will never understand what it means to be black until they treat it like a nigger. We have different fights. LGBTQ has a fight. Black folk have a fight. Asians, Latinos, everybody has a fight. Women have a fight. Everybody's fighting for justice and equality, but no one will get it. And here's the reason why. It's because there is no unity across the board. 
If the bottom 99% ever came together, if the bottom 99% ever came together, that's where a revolution would happen. That's where the change happens. And every time someone came up to unite the 99%, they were struck down. MLK, Malcolm X, Jesus Christ. Every time someone came up to unite the 99%, they were struck down. Why haven't leaders been killed today? It's because they only appeal to a certain group. They're not changing the 99 percentile. So how can we create change today? Well, there are keys to the revolution. We need a revolution. The spirit of Christ calls for a revolution. There are two keys to a revolution, and I want you to get these keys today. Number one, we have to train our households to fight in service to humanity. Don't forget, when Lot was stolen, when he was taken away from Sodom into captivity, that's when Abram got busy. Verse 13, and that's where Abram, look what the text says, that it says there that he gathered 318 men born in his house and trained for this. Mm. I told you, long before we talk about tithing, we got to get the revolution straight. It's a wonderful story. Can you imagine this? Abram is wealthy. He's anointed of God. God has blessed him. But yet, everyone born in his house, every servant, born in his house, he made sure that they were trained to fight for other people outside of the house. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 and 25. I want you to turn there. Book of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Verses 24 and 25. The first key to the revolution is we've got to train our households to fight in service to humanity. Verse 13, Abram the Hebrew, the passed over, the left out. In verse 14, he arms his trained servants born in his own house. And he says, let's go fight to get back what was taken. Let's go fight to get back who was taken. Hebrews 11, 24, 25. When you've got it, say amen. amen. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. When Moses reached a certain age, a certain point of understanding and growth, maturity, he decided to make a life decision. He no longer wanted to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He was cutting off being a son of Egypt, the prince. Look what verse five, 25 says. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Listen, we will never have a, re a revolution. Black people will never have a revolution until we get a spirit like Moses. Look what he did. He gave up Egypt and chose to live in affliction, to live in suffering with the people of God. One of the problems in every movement is the fact that the people at the top, when they get satisfied, they go away. We, we're seeing this in the news now with Black Lives Matter. Out of, out, of, out of millions and millions and millions of dollars, we now find out that millions were spent on homes from all across America, even to Canada. Mansions were purchased by those at the top. And ain't it crazy that the three women that started this thing, 
they were accredited, which started it, ain't with it no more because they all got projects. They, they, they said that, that this is all about justice. But once they got their piece of the pie, they gone. You don't have to say amen. Go read the news. I'm right. Movements are not to be equated with revolution. And too often what happens is when people in the house get satisfied, not just Black Lives Matter, Jesse Jackson got a running record. When his rainbow push coalition, when, when, when workers are done wrong, Jesse would come in. He'd raise hell and create a news uh, uh, chaos. But once they, once they signed up for a program that they're going to pay, platinum or whatever it is in the rainbow push, he'd go away. Once he got paid, he'd go away. There was a panel discussion. They were on a panel discussion. Jesse Jackson was on a panel discussion. And one of the panelists was the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And on this panel discussion, Jesse Jackson talks about, oh, we're making changes. All things are changing. We're, we're changing. Everything is changing. And at the other end of the table, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan just sat there, didn't say a word, just poised. Other people are clapping. And then when, when it came time for uh, the Honorable Minister to speak, one of the things that he said was, how can we be happy just because some people at the top got paid? And I'm paraphrasing. But too often, that's what happens. Do you realize Malcolm X died poor? Do you realize Martin King died poor? If it wasn't for Harry Belafonte, uh, Martin King and his family would have been outdoors. Because the bills were not paid. Dr. King took the money from the Nobel Peace Prize and he put that back into his work. Did you not know that when Dr. King died, over 70% of Americans were against him? And that's black folk included. We celebrate him now. Dr. King holiday. Oh, Dr. King, Dr. King, I have a dream, Dr. King. But over 70% of Americans were against him when he lived because of his stance on the Vietnam War. And he took the stance against the Vietnam War because he said, you can't get poor people out of poverty if you're busy fighting a war. He preached at the Riverside Church. And he said, and I quote in New York, that the United States is the greatest purveyor of evil on the planet. And a year to the day later, the next year on that, that exact day, he was gunned down and killed. Nine months earlier, he got a call from Nixon saying, be quiet. Here is the problem that brings point, point one. Households have to train to fight in service to humanity. Who are you raising? If you're not raising people in your household to fight outside the house, to fight for the, the rights and the life of others, you have failed God. It is not enough to raise your children, your grandchildren, to just have their dreams. Revolution happens, change will happen when we raise up our children and our grandchildren to fight for the rights of others. We don't have that anymore. We just have our children go to college, get your job. We got a Clarence Thomas mentality. I got mine, you've got to get yours. But until we can fight for others. Moses gave up Egypt and chose to suffer with the people of God. Number two, here is the key. Be willing to sacrifice our all. Somebody say all. Our all in service to humanity. That's the two keys. The Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 13, turn there. The Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 13. The Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 13 says, Greater love hath no man than this that a man laid down his life for his friends. 
I often wonder why we're not seeing, you know, more assassinations or anything anymore. And it's not because the philosophy has changed. The problem is we don't have leaders and people that are willing to go all the way to sacrifice all. Think about it. Right in the black community, we have limited people who protest because we got too much to lose. There are people, <coughs> when, when Jamar Clark was killed, shortly after I got here, when Jamar Clark was killed, and, and I'm trying to get the church to, to come out, just come to church to be a part of, of the meeting, of the worship we're gonna have. We had the mayor there, we had police there, we had uh, gangs there, we had police come out, we had everyone there, but members of the church wouldn't come, and I couldn't figure out why, but then I was told afterward, right there at Fellowship, they, they told me, we got too much to lose. That's what I was told. We have jobs, we have pensions, we have retirements, we have uh, networks, we have people that depend on us, and we don't want to be associated with that. One of the problems that we'll face in the church all the time right here in North Minneapolis is too many of us don't live in North Minneapolis, and so what happens in North Minneapolis, it doesn't bother us that much. As long as it doesn't impact us when we come to church, we're good. You don't have to say anything. I know I'm right. One of the things that we have to grow to do is be willing to sacrifice our all. Go back up. Remember when I told you about the gospel of Jesus Christ, that it changes the individual, and when the, when the gospel really changes an individual, it'll change society because of the economy and politics and government of it all? When the gospel of Jesus Christ is real in us, you will sacrifice everything for your neighbor. Even if it costs you your house, your income, or your life, when the love of Christ is real, you'll sacrifice it all. Until we get the love of Christ right, we're not going to see a revolution. Let's just establish that right now. Let's just admit that. That's not pessimism. That's reality. Because there's a limit to how far we'll go. There's a limit to how far we'll go. When the right, when the uh, cause is right, when the cause is right, and God is in it, God will lead you to give you a spirit of willingness to give it all up if I have to. Now, I may not have to give it all up, but if I have to, I'm willing to lose everything because I believe in and I know God is in the fight. Now, let's be clear. God ain't in all the fights. Notice, we had other deaths right here. Philando Castile, Jamar Clark, we've had other deaths right here. But it wasn't until they killed the right one, George Floyd, who happened to be the wrong one, that there was a movement all around the world. Something got started. But, but watch this. What happened to the movement? All it is now is a mural. Everybody what? Went right back to work. Went right back to life and business as normal. Movements are not rebellion because a movement will start and stop, but a true rebellion that seeks revolution never ends. It won't quit. Why? Because I'm completely invested in this and I'm willing to stay with it and I might have to give it all up. I might have to lose it all. Now, this, I want to leave you with a quick word. My time has run, run far. Martin Niemöller. German theologian, pastor, prisoner. He left an amazing legacy. Listen to what he said. This is his poem called First They Came. First they came for the socialists 
and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. A revolution to overturn the system will only happen when we are willing to lose it all. Right in your house. This was his nephew. This was Abram's nephew who had his own house. He wasn't in Abram's house, but because he was connected with Abram, when Abram heard that they got him, he got everybody in his house. Abram was anointed. He was wealthy. Now notice, when he went to war, it don't even say he prayed about it. It don't say that he had God's protection. I don't want us to over-spiritualize this thing. Well, I'm going because I've got God's protection. God is over me. God is before me. God is behind me. I'm going in Jesus' name. Text don't say he prayed. Don't say God led him to go. Once he got word that Lot was taken, he called everybody together and said, let's go. You've been trained, and this is what you've been trained for. Let's go get to work. And they made easy work of the enemy, the wicked king, and they brought everything back home. And I said that to say this, when you know stuff is right, don't make excuses, just go do it. He prepared in good times for a dark day. He was prepared. He trained them. You in an, an anointed rich house. A wealthy house, but you were training for a fight. Had no idea when it would come. The fight came, and they were ready. We've got to raise up a generation of people under us. Not just to be individually successful, but to make sure that their success contains an eye for other people outside of them. That's how we win. That's how we make a change in society. When we can help people make a change outside of our house. And we've got to be willing to sacrifice. Now listen, you know, my time has come and gone. Just that quick, 48 minutes. Any questions, any comments? We're going to pick up. It wouldn't have done us any good to just go right into tithing because tithing came from this story. Because once Abram came back from getting the victory, he then stood before king and priest Melchizedek, who has no mother, no father, no beginning, and no end. And he gave him a tithe. This is the first mention of tithing in the Bible. And here is an argument that we'll get into next week. It's over 2,000 years from Adam to Abram. And now we see tithing, and it's a fundamental feature of his relationship with the priest. So for over 2,000 years, tithing has been since the beginning, and this text predates the law by 467 years. So no, it wasn't under the law. It was already a part of the relationship. And this scripture text is under grace. See, don't forget, the original state of man was grace. The dispensation or the season was grace. And when they went into Egyptian captivity, that is where the law had to come because mankind forfeited grace. This is grace, and under grace, Creflo, I'm talking to you. <laughs> Tithing was a natural part of the relationship. So before there was a law, there was grace. Grace, law, and grace again. And so it was grace all the time. Any questions, any comments? Everybody all right? All right, don't ask me something after I leave here. Well, Pastor, I, 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 I got a question. I don't have an answer. You missed your time. Come on, let's pray.
Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this opportunity. I thank you, O oh God, that we've been able to dive into your word. Let a spark be ignited from us today to develop a greater sensitivity for the hour before us, and also, O oh God, of greater strength that will cause us to build ourselves toward a revolution, not just worldwide, but a revolution around us, O oh God, that we might inspire change within those closest to us. Bless us, O oh God, and use us to your glory, use us to your honor, both now and forever. I pray for the worship at hand in this next hour, that your spirit will pervade, that the power of your presence will fall, and we will rise into your presence, O oh God, and we will walk from this place declaring, it was good to have been here. This is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Now listen, I want to see you next Sunday, 9 o'clock. We're going to keep on going. Is that all right? Amen. All right, I'll see you then. Let's get ready for 10 o'clock worship. <laughs>